Welcome to our career development seminar series. And this one is a, a really exciting one. Well, all of them are exciting, but I'm I, I'm very excited about this one. It's design thinking for innovation. The next slide. I want to introduce our speaker, Danielle Piscicini. PC, tell me how you pronounce it. Piccinini, like Piccinini. the fruit anini. <laughs> Perfect, Italian. So Danielle uh, Piccinini Black. Uh, who uh, is from Johns Hopkins or is working at Johns Hopkins, but actually living in LA. Is that correct? Correct. She's here with us. Um, she's the academic leader designing for innovation at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School, um, executive education, and also the design innovation lead at the Johns Hopkins Center for Communications Program. Danielle, thank you so much for coming. We've had a couple of meetings. We know each other a tiny bit. We're so excited to have you here. And I know that everyone who comes to this will be very excited to learn what you have to teach us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for inviting me. I know many of you braved the rain <laughs> to be here today. I was telling Karen when I logged on just a few minutes ago that my power was out all day yesterday and I just wasn't sure what today held for me. So I'm really glad that the power is on and hopefully it stays on. Um, but yeah, fun times in LA. I, you know, who says LA doesn't have extreme weather? We're, sh we're really showing them now. <laughs> all right. So I am here to talk about design thinking. And before we do that, I want to do a little creative activity to get our creative juices flowing. It's the end of the day. So let's do something a little bit creative. What I'd like you all to do is I'd like you to take a moment to look at this really crazy object you've never seen before um, on the screen. I have no idea what it is, and I'm sure you also have no idea what it is. And what I would like you to do is to take two minutes to come up with a quick sales pitch about the item you see on your screen and how it is used. The catch is, is that it cannot be used for its actual real life use, okay? So a two minute pitch to come up with, a, a two minutes to come up with a quick sales pitch about this item, what it is and how it's used. And remember, it cannot be used for its actual real life use. This is a great tool to wrap a birthday present, to help you <laughs> wrap a birthday present. I love that. Beautiful. It's like the most beautiful present you've ever seen with this lovely item wrapped around it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? You could also use this item to hold up your pants in case you forgot your belt. Ooh, classy. I like it. Might be the 14th rendition of the Apple iPod Pro. It's uh, <laughs> abstract art meets, uh, meets listening device. Lovely. <laughs> yes. Um. Introducing the sleek, slim black design of a new of the new necklace three thousand, which is flexible, durable, and goes with any outfit. Nice. Oh, yeah, super stylish. I like it. <laughs> I thought of this as like a child leash for more freeform parents. So if your child really does want to run free through the park, they can break through the uh, the loose hold on their wrist. <laughs> <laughs> How kind! <laughs> I love it. Uh, I was going in the iPhone route as well, but this is uh, Apple's new uh, dual charger for your phone. Guess what? You'd all need to throw away your old chargers and your old phones because now there's a new port that you use. But on the other end, it's a contactless like charger you can mm -hmm. place another phone on and then you can charge two phones on the other end at one time. Ooh, I like that. Perfect for families. <laughs> All right, well, in this activity, you were breaking the real life rules of this object, and that opened you up to look at it in a new creative light. So this concept is directly applicable to design thinking. In design thinking, we are seeking to find solutions to complex problems, and oftentimes we need to find alternative or creative ways to accomplish something using the resources that we have available to us. 
So really looking at things a little bit differently as we're going through design in order to come up with innovative solutions. So now that we're all feeling like designers, we're feeling creative, ready to roll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about design thinking. But we cannot start our conversation about design thinking without first talking about human-centered design. How many of you have heard or have been exposed to human-centered design? Raise your hand, give me a thumbs up. I'm seeing some hands. Great, okay, awesome. So human-centered design is really a framework for fully understanding the needs, desires, and constraints of end users and key stakeholders. So it's really this empathetic framework for problem solving. Okay, human centered design is really about acknowledging that the end users and that the related stakeholders are all experts. So they're not subjects in research, but they're actually experts and partners in the process. So it's really about placing those end users and related stakeholders at the center of your research and design. Human-centered design is also iterative and it's creative and it's innovative. And finally, human-centered design is really complementary to other research methods that we all use, those being quantitative or qualitative. It's very complementary um, and something that I want you to consider as I share more about human-centered design and design thinking. So as I mentioned, human-centered design is really this framework for many different approaches and techniques that are human-centered and empathy-focused. Which approach, which process, which technique you use really depends on your industry and your scope of work. So you'll see lots of different problem-solving processes that leverage a human-centered design framework on the screen. Design thinking, which is the human-centered design process I'm going to detail for you today, is arguably one of the most common human-centered design processes. So what is design thinking? Well, design thinking is not a scientific formula for solution generation with guaranteed predictable results. So if that's what you were hoping for, I'm really sorry to burst your bubble, but that's not what it is at all. Rather, what design thinking is, is a transdisciplinary, human-centered, creative problem-solving process that emphasizes empathy, perspective-taking, iterative prototyping, and testing. So you're probably thinking, that is the clunkiest definition I have ever seen for anything. Um, but actually, it's clunky intentionally. Every single piece of this definition is really important. And I just am going to highlight two of those pieces for you right now. The first is this concept of transdisciplinary. So in design thinking, we aim to leverage multidisciplinary teams. And what we create using the design thinking process extends beyond the sum of those individual disciplines. So essentially what we've created using design thinking isn't just a sum of the parts, it extends beyond that sum, it's transdisciplinary. And human-centered is underlined because placing a strong emphasis on those for whom you're designing and making those folks, those end users and key stakeholders central to your process really helps you to ensure that what you're designing is not only empathy-centric, but that it's also novel, useful, and feasible. In design thinking, we really aim to bring in people with both lived and living experience. And by doing so, we work hand in hand with them as research partners rather than research participants in order to identify those creative solutions together. So what does this design thinking process look like? Well, there actually isn't just one design thinking process. Design thinking can take many different forms and different companies, organizations, and schools have their own processes or variations of a process. So this process that you see on the screen is one of the most recognizable ones. This is IDEO's three-stage design thinking process. So the first stage in their process is inspiration, which is focused on the problem, defining the problem and understanding the problem. The second phase, ideation, which is really the, pause, the process of generating and developing and testing ideas for the problem. So testing ideas, testing solutions for the given problem. And then finally, implementation. So that's really what brings 
the solution to market or to the field. So the graphic at the bottom highlights the divergence and convergence from start to finish in the design thinking process and also highlights that this process is not linear and has no end. Similarly, here's a design thinking process from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So this is a six step design thinking process. It's circular in nature, it's looping, it's iterative and has no definitive ending. Here's another one. This one comes from Design Council and this is the double diamond design thinking model, really highlighting the divergence and convergence that exists within design thinking. So you're probably noticing that with all of the processes that I've showed you so far, that there really is no definitive end point in any of them. They are all iterative and there is no end. And that's by design. Now here is the five step design thinking process that I'm going to discuss in detail today. This is the one that is adapted from a process developed at the Stanford Design School and the one that we champion at Johns Hopkins University. So what I really like about this five step process um, is that it has five clear distinct steps. These five steps are embedded in the other processes I showed you, even if they aren't explicitly named. But what's nice about this is it's very explicit, kind of what, what, goes, what goes where and how it all fits together. So we're gonna detail this process just now. I'm gonna go through each of the five steps to explain what happens at each step. And we will then move into a little bit of practice at the end of the session. So when you start design thinking, you start the process with a challenge. And identifying a challenge is probably one of the most important parts of the design thinking process. So there's this common misconception that design thinking can only be used for product development, but that isn't the case at all. Design thinking can really be used for a wide variety of things. It can be used to design a product. It can also be used to solve a problem or to improve a system or process or to come up with a new intervention or program. It really can be used for any problem that relates to humans, okay? That human centered nature of design thinking. So coming up with the challenge that you're solving with design thinking is a really important step in the process because you want to make sure that you're working with the right problem with the right target audience in mind. And to do this requires some research on the topic and also buy-in from the stakeholders involved in the process. Those of you who have been familiar, or who are familiar with design thinking and human-centered design, even a little bit, might notice that the framing of design challenges is often done in a positive light. So you'll see them framed in um, with words like reimagining or exploring or how might we, and those are all very common frames for design thinking challenges. And the reason we frame challenges that way in design thinking is because we want to suggest a solution as possible. And by suggesting a solution as possible with a framing like that, it opens people up to think more creatively about solutions. So once you have your challenge, you jump into the five-step process which of course starts with the empathy phase, okay? So during the empathy, empathy phase, you first determine who your relevant stakeholders are and you learn about them. So this phase is central to the human-centered nature of design thinking. And it's in this phase that we leverage both primary and secondary research with a strong emphasis on the primary, I would say, to understand our end users and our related stakeholders. Some very common tools that we use in this empathy phase are, you know, some of those traditional research methods that you all know and love, key informant interviews, observations, focus group discussions. Those are all wonderful ways to engage stakeholders in this empathy phase of the design thinking process. So once you move on from the empathy phase, you move into the second phase, which is the defined phase. But what I'll say is, is even though the empathy phase is a distinct phase in the process, we actually want to be intentional about weaving it through the entire process because ultimately our goal is to come up with solutions that are rooted in empathy, that deep understanding of those who we're designing for. So the second phase of the process is the define phase. And when you're using a design thinking process, you start with an overall challenge 
And then during this phase, you research the landscape of that challenge, pulling the information you learned about the stakeholders in the empathy phase. And then you're also looking more broadly at the challenge landscape, looking at things like environmental, regulatory, political factors, all things that play a role in the challenge itself. And ultimately, you'll use this information on the landscape of the challenge alongside the information gathered in empathy to identify key insights that you will then use to refocus your original design challenge and use as a springboard for ideation or for brainstorming. So that brings us to the third phase of the process, which is ideation. So once you have all of your data, and I use that in quotes, but once you have all of your data, it's time for you to really come up with those solutions for your design challenge. Oftentimes, people want to jump to this phase of the process without properly completing the first two phases of the process, but that's human nature, right? If I present you with a challenge, are you going to want to immediately come up with a solution? Yeah, probably, right? That, that's just what we do. That's how our minds work. But in design thinking, we try very hard to avoid this tendency because we want to make sure that our solutions are rooted in empathy, that deep understanding of those that we're designing for. The fourth phase of the process is prototyping. And this is the fun part. This is where you get to put together a low fidelity or a rough draft prototype of your proposed solution or solutions. So in design thinking, we emphasize rough draft models or low fidelity prototypes because research and practice has shown that if you ask for feedback on something that is seemingly complete, you're less likely to receive open and honest and useful feedback on it right? Like that makes sense. If you present someone something that's like perfectly packaged with a beautiful bow, they're, they're not going to give you that feedback you want because they're going to perceive their, that they're going to perceive that their feedback won't make much of a difference. The solution's already pretty much final. On the flip side, if you give someone something that looks more rough, they're more likely to perceive that there's actually a possibility for their feedback to make a difference on that final product because there's a, a big space between what you're showing them and what that final solution can be. So we emphasize rough draft, low fidelity prototypes in design thinking, which then brings us to the testing phase. So in the testing phase is when you take your prototype or your rough draft solution to test with the user for feedback. So testing can take many different forms depending on the nature of your prototype and the target user. And the findings from the testing phase will determine what you need to do to your solution in order to make sure that it resonates with the end user and addresses the challenge at hand. So this is a common point of iteration in design thinking. It's when you get that feedback, you determine what tweaks need to be made, where do you need to jump back into your process to learn more. So in research and intervention design, we talk a lot about pre-testing. And I wanna make a clear distinction between pre-testing and design and testing and design thinking. So pre-testing commonly takes place when a solution or a tool or an intervention or a program is pretty much complete and you're rolling it out for final feedback before you do that final rollout. Whereas testing and design thinking happens when solutions are very much in their infancy and you wanna get that early feedback and iterate as many times as needed before you're getting to that final solution. So in design thinking, we test low fidelity prototypes early and often to use as a springboard for iteration. So throughout this five-step process, there are natural points of divergence and convergence built in. So during divergence, you gather as much information as possible. And during convergence is where you work to make sense of all of that information. So in design thinking, you're constantly shifting gears on your way to the solution. Um, and because of this, we encourage design thinking practitioners to really practice and embrace ambiguity and feel comfortable in this feeling of ambiguity. All right, so five steps to success, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, check. Well, kind of, but not really. It really more looks like this. When design thinking is done well, it is iterative, it is looping, it is messy. So as much as we like things to look neat like this, 
unfortunately, I'm here to tell you this doesn't, this is not neat at all. Yes, there are five clearly defined steps, but it is common to go back and forth between the stages depending on the nature of the challenge and the insights that you gather at each phase. So that's why it's so important to embrace ambiguity. You spend a lot of time dealing with ambiguity when you're using a design thinking process. I also want to note that no two design thinking processes are identical. So the way you use design thinking and how you go at the process will be unique for each and every scope of work, each and every audience that you use design thinking with. And ultimately, through maximizing the iterative nature of design thinking and leaning in to its empathetic nature, you're ultimately going to strive to come up with creative solutions that are really at this intersection of feasible, viable, and desirable. And that's the ultimate goal, to come up with solutions that are right there in that sweet spot. So that is a quick summary of what design thinking is. I would like to take a moment now to kind of bring it to life a little bit with some examples. And after we do some examples, I'm going to give you a chance to practice it because there's no better way to master design thinking than to practice it. It's also really fun, I promise. So stay tuned. But let's talk about some design thinking today. And I'm going to share a few examples of how it's used today, but I want to share that while many folks think design thinking is actually this new, fancy, fun process, it actually has been around for a while. So it has its roots in the 60s and the engineering field, and then it became more mainstream in the 90s when it started to become um, prominent in the business space. So it's been around a bit. But we're starting to see people leveraging it more and more in many different fields. So this first example I'm going to share with you is one from the Beacon Children's Hospital in South Bend, Indiana. So they use design thinking to come up with a way to reduce stress and worry among patients and their families. So what they did is they did some research to determine one of the biggest pain points is for patients and families that have extended stays, they often feel kind of stuck in the hospital. They can't get out as much as they would like. So this insight led them to a design thinking process to improve the patient and family experience in the hospital. And what they did and what they came up with as their solution was this wonderful idea to bring the outdoors in by creating hallways to look like breaths of fresh air. So they did this by using murals and artwork to make the inside look like the outside. And by doing that, it really helped the patients feel like, you know, they could have that little breath of fresh air that they were all really hoping for. The next one is one of my favorite examples of all time. So this is General Electric. So General Electric, they do cool stuff. They do really cool stuff. And um, they sought to improve the pediatric patient experience with CT, X-ray, and MRI scanning. And they did this by creating a scanner experience that children wouldn't just tolerate, but they would love. I mean, talk about a tall order. You know, that is not a fun experience for anyone to go through a CT, and X-ray, or an MRI. But not only did they want to make it tolerable, they wanted to make it an actually, you know, wonderful, enjoyable experience for children. So after extensive user research, they developed these pirate adventure machines and rooms. Um, and so what they did is they not only redesigned the scanner to look like part of a pirate ship, but they also redesigned the entire room. So when you look at pictures of this, it almost looks like a ride at Disneyland. Like they've really decked it out. There's soundtracks that go along with the whole scanning adventure for the kids. And the creator of this innovation said that his greatest reward was when he was talking to the, the mother of a six-year-old who had just been scanned using the, the pirate ship. And when the child came to her mother, she said, mom, mom, can we come back tomorrow? And, you know, that simple question really warmed the heart of of the designer of this innovation and made him realize that his user research had really done him well. He had created an experience that children would love and would actually want to come back to. 
<clears throat> Our next example that used design thinking was PillPack. So PillPack is an online pharmacy, which, and their mission is to create um, an easier experience for medication dispensing and medication adherence. So PillPack worked with IDEO, which is the flagship design thinking firm in the Bay Area to achieve this mission. So for those of you who are not familiar with PillPack, it's kind of cool. So the doctors send the prescription straight to the pharmacist at PillPack. They organize the medications which include refills, over-the-counter drugs, vitamins, supplements, et cetera. And they put them into pre-sorted personalized packets. And the packets are labeled with the date and time that they need to be taken and then delivered to the individual's doorstep in about, like, I think it's like a 14-day supply. Um, so this is, in, this is designed so it would fit really seamlessly into people's homes and into people's lifestyles. Amazon bought PillPack in 2018, so they <laughs> they they saw this as a really wonderful opportunity. In addition to what I just shared with you, on your screen are some other familiar brands that leverage design thinking very frequently. B of A, they developed the Keep the Change program, so when people enroll in a savings account, that it would round up purchases made with their debit cards and put that overage automatically into their savings account. That was designed using design thinking. Airbnb through design thinking learned that investing in high quality images of homes increased the likelihood of people renting the homes. Um, and so that became part of Airbnb's model using professional photographers. Oral-B use design thinking to help simplify the, electro the electric toothbrush, specifically the charging and ordering components. Netflix, I mean, they are a design thinking champion. They are the ones who, you know, were the first to deliver DVDs to your door. Then they went to streaming. And now they figured out how, you know, using trailers that run unprompted, get people to watch things that they might not otherwise watch. So they're really at the forefront of using um, design thinking. And it's really served them well. Uber Eats is another wonderful example. Uber Eats provides their driver step-by-step -step instructions for pickup to delivery to make the process completely seamless because sometimes you know a, a driver would get an order and the there would be a lot of confusion between the order and where it was getting delivered to etc so what they did is they used design thinking to streamline the process and ultimately come up with a step-by-step -step way for drivers to have a seamless experience from order to delivery so those are some practical examples of how design thinking is being used in a wide variety of fields. And so you might be thinking to yourself, okay, this all sounds cool, five-step process, iterative, not sure how I feel about that piece, ambiguity, not sure how I feel about that piece, those examples are cool. But I want to talk to you a little bit about why all of this works. So why does design thinking work? So design thinking works because of that human-centered focus where you really learn from and design with the target user. So doing this not only provides you with a better understanding of the end users and their needs and desires, but engaging them in the process also increases the buy-in for whatever you're producing. And that is huge, right? That buy-in piece is absolutely huge. So if you can engage folks in the process and not only design something that better meets their needs, but also you know, guarantees or is, gets you a higher likelihood of their buy-in for that solution, that is massive when we're looking at adherence, when we're looking at uptake, when we're looking at sustainability. The next is emphasis on multidisciplinary teams. So also in design thinking, we emphasize the importance and the benefit of using multidisciplinary teams. This is important because having people from different backgrounds and different experiences really allows you to leverage different strengths and provides you diverse perspectives on the challenge at hand. So by having those diverse perspectives, by having those different strengths, experiences, et cetera, it'll ultimately help you to come up with solutions that are really novel, creative, innovative. Of course, there are challenges that go along with, with multidisciplinary teams. Of course, power dynamics might be one, but there are lots of different tools that you can use to manage those power dynamics so that folks from all different 
disciplines from all different experiences, backgrounds, et cetera, can come to the table and work as equals in co-design. Also in design thinking, we embrace failure. We're big on failure in design thinking. We want to fail. We want to fail a lot. But when I say fail, I'm saying, you know, we don't want to fail at the end, but we want to fail throughout the process because we learn from our fails. We want to have those micro fails, learn from those fails, iterate and keep testing and keep iterating and keep testing and keep iterating until we have our final solution. And this is beneficial because if we continue to fail throughout the process, by the time we're ready to roll something out, it's really already been vetted. So there's a higher likelihood of success. We also want to have a beginner's mind when utilizing a design thinking process. And that's kind of like checking all of the baggage at the door before you start the process. And by doing so, really freeze your head of any preconceived notions um, that could cloud your judgment. And it helps you to see things with a fresh perspective. Easier said than done, of course, but we really aim to be intentional about this and really embrace that beginner's mind in our work. And then finally, embracing ambiguity. So in design thinking, we start from a place of not knowing the answer to the problem. And that's exactly where we want to be. We do not want to know the answer. We want to trust the process. We want to trust that it's going to lead us to a solution. And we don't want to rush to get there. So we really lean in to ambiguity throughout the design thinking process. I'm going to pause and see if anybody has any questions about anything that I've covered so far. I have a question. Please. Can you can you give an example of what embracing ambiguity would look like in some example? Sure. So embracing ambiguity, I would say when I see people who are doing design thinking for the first time, embracing ambiguity really means being okay with not knowing the solution. So from the beginning, we present a challenge. And oftentimes, as I mentioned before, we have a tendency to want to rush to the solution. But rather, we want to sit in the space of ambiguity so we can really process all of the insights that are emerging through our research in order to ultimately get to a better solution. So it, you know, as a de design thinking facilitator, it's something that we will encourage over and over again, sit in that space of ambiguity of not knowing and use it to catalyze thought and momentum through the process rather than getting specifically to a solution before, um, before you should. Thank Great you. Question. Thank you. I had a question about sort of the multidisciplinary teams and, and knowing whether you've got enough people in the room that cover sort of different different disciplines, like is there sort of a, an optimum and, and like how do you know that you've gotten there? Yeah, I, I love that question. And I think the best way to do this or how I like to do this is I like to, well, first let's imagine that the world is our oyster. We have access to everyone. We have endless amounts of money and time, right? Let's just imagine an ideal space. So in an ideal world, what I would like to do is I would look to look at the challenge that I'm hoping to solve and then I would conduct something called a stakeholder map. So a stakeholder map, for those who are not familiar, it's where you identify all of the stakeholders related to the challenge, and then you map them. And by mapping them, you look at their relevance to the challenge, their connections with one another, dynamics at play that might exist between stakeholders, all those different things come into play. But by mapping them, you would then determine who would you ideally need at the table in order to make sure you have a comprehensive picture of the challenge at hand and have the right people in the room to solve that challenge. So again, in our ideal world space, you would, you would gather that team to do the work and then you would start the work. As you're going through the work, if you identify that additional stakeholders would be important to bring to the table, then I always encourage people to bring them in at that point. There's a tendency for folks when utilizing design thinking, you start with an initial team, you're like, I'm just gonna power through with this team, even if it's the wrong team. Not the answer, right? There's always opportunities to course correct in design thinking. So again, you know, that's really nice. That's a nice component of the iterative nature of design thinking is this opportunity to always course correct. 
So two steps, one, look at your design challenge, come up with the ideal stakeholders, all that looking at all the stakeholders related to that challenge. And then two, go through that process and be open to identifying additional or different stakeholders that you want to bring to the table as part of that multidisciplinary team and do so. Thanks for the question. If we have time, I actually I had one more sort of related to the um, viability and, and feasibility and whether those come together more often in a in the the five different steps that you laid out whether you're sort of bumping up against feasibility and viability in particular stages of that process and and how to like think about a, approaching those challenges sure i you know i think that your this question about and i'll pull up that diagram really quick so we can all take an, a peek at it one more time did you do so for me, what I've found is that this diagram can be pretty abstract at times. You're like, okay, cool, like feasible, desirable, viable, sure, check, check, check. But what I've found with this specifically is in order to know if your solution is going to be feasible, desirable, and viable, it's critical to have those right stakeholders at the table when you're assembling your multidisciplinary team, right? Because when you're thinking about desirable, you're thinking about desirable from the end user perspective? Is this desirable for the end user and related stakeholders who are involved in whatever that solution is? Is it feasible? Is it something we actually have time and budget for? Is it viable? So if you think about all of the people that would have the answers to those questions and know that, those are different stakeholders, right? It's not gonna be the same stakeholder that's going to know that. So bringing together and being intentional about that multidisciplinary teaming at the beginning will help you to make sure that you come up with something that really meets that sweet spot. With that said, while this is ultimately the goal in design thinking, if your scope of work doesn't need to address all three of these things, then you don't have to, right? If you just need to come up some, with something that's desirable, great, check, focus on that. But ideally, and most often, whether we're explicit about it or not, all, all the solutions that we're coming up with using design thinking or not, that somewhere in this intersection, maybe leaning towards one circle over another a little bit more, but um, but we really you know want to get there, and that multi multidisciplinary team is really the way the way to get there. And oftentimes, what you'll learn as you're using design thinking is it's through testing that will help you determine: Are you in this sweet spot, or do you need to do some additional research, or you know, engage additional people in order to get more information in order to get you to that spot. Great question. So Adam, my answer to you for everything is gonna be multidisciplinary teaming. <laughs> All right, and I see a question in the chat. So human design seems similar to the quality improvement PDSA framework. Melissa, can you talk a little bit about that? It's not really a question. It was just an observation. Okay. That, that, thank you for sharing. Then does anyone have any thoughts on that? I had the same thought as we were looking through it, is that it seemed to have a lot of similarities to that framework. Um but maybe more the empathy part is not where I've always seen PDSA implemented. Yeah, and if I remember our conversation about this earlier, Elizabeth, it really was, that was that was what we determined was kind of that big difference was this emphasis on empathy in design thinking. Um, and I think there, you know, there's opportunities to look at design thinking next to that PDSA framework and say kind of where are, where is there overlap? Where are those differences? Um, and how can we utilize the best of, of the different frameworks. Great. Any other questions at this point? All right, let me talk a little bit now about how long does it take to do design thinking, right? Is this something that's quick? Is it something that takes forever? What are we looking at here? So what's really cool about design thinking is that it's a really flexible problem solving process when it comes to time. So it can be something that can be done as 
quickly as a sprint. And what do I mean by a sprint? A sprint can be anything from a few hours to a day. Some of you might have heard of the term a hackathon. A hackathon is an example of a design thinking sprint, then very fast paced, very collaborative, pulling in all those multidisciplinary folks. That would be an example of a short sprint um, utilization of design thinking. The next and one of the most common would be multi-day workshops. And this normally takes the form of three to five full days, whether they be you know, full or multiple half days, whatever works best for the stakeholders. But this, we're talking about a longer term engagement. And this is where you would go through in depth all of the five steps of the design thinking process with the multidisciplinary teams. Then, of course, we have long term research and program cycles. And this is where design thinking can be used like many different forms of qualitative research. So you would have a research team that's looking to address a problem, you would develop a protocol and you would carry out the research. I've been part of long-term research projects using design thinking that have been years, have been months. Um, it really just, it runs the range. But overall, the benefit of having a long-term design thinking research project is that it gives you that opportunity to look at the infusion of traditional quantitative and qualitative research methods and what that can look like within a design thinking process. So something that you might want to think about considering as you look to leverage a design thinking process in your work and in your research. And of course, you always have the opportunity to combine any of the approaches that you see on the screen. You can have a long-term research project that has a few sprints embedded in it, et cetera. You know, whatever works for your scope of work um, can be used um, when doing design thinking. So before we jump into practice, I want to end with this. I want to end with some considerations for using design thinking or human-centered design. So these are a few that I think are really important. Um, but of course, you may have some to add, and I would love to hear from you or to hear any questions that you have. But the first is to verify that a specific solution is not already dictated by your scope of work or you know, by your funder, for example. So when you're using design thinking, it's really important to be open to different types of solutions that really emerge organically from the process and to not have a solution already in mind. So in order to really maximize the value of this process, you want to make sure that you do not have a solution dictated. Next, you wanna confirm that you're tackling the right challenge. So to do this, it really requires a good amount of research before your design work. It's important that there's a, it's important to think um, about the distinction between a problem and a design challenge. So the former really might be the catalyst for your work, but the latter is gonna be that more nuanced challenge that takes research to uncover. So for example, let's see. So if I'm gonna say, what's the difference between a problem and a design challenge? So the problem could be, uh, let's say traveling, because I'm, you know, got travel on the brain. So travelers through major international airports, they, they feel stressed. Okay, that could be our problem. A design challenge that we could uncover through research would be reimagining the traveler experience from airport arrival to plane boarding in order to reduce stress and worry. So how that's more nuanced is that we see that the pain point is that point of arrival to boarding. And that's where our, our design would focus. Okay, so that's that distinction between the problem and the design challenge. Three is the gaining buy-in from key stakeholders and funders. So it's critical that all of the stakeholders involved in your project are brought to the table and are able to discuss as equals the design thinking process that you're using and the challenge that you're trying to solve. So getting this buy-in from the beginning will really increase the likelihood for support for the solutions that you create and that are generated from your design thinking process. So buy-in from day one is essential. Four, ensuring access to stakeholders related to the challenge. So as I've said before, our design thinking is all about empathy, designing with the folks that you're designing for. So access to stakeholders is absolutely critical. So this means the users themselves, related stakeholders, anyone central to the, the design process and your design challenge, you want to have access to them so you can engage them in the problem solving process as partners, not as subjects. The fifth is 
it goes back to the multidisciplinary teams, Adam. So determining who sits on that multidisciplinary team based on the scope is so important. Okay. We've talked about the power of leveraging multidisciplinary teams. So taking the time to think about who needs to be on the team and how to engage them is really, really important and will help you to determine what process you need to take, how the process needs to look, um, and kind of the, the different modifications you need for different contexts. Six is champion ethical championing ethical design. So you might be thinking, all right, human-centered design and design thinking, they sound like ethical problem-solving approaches as they are. And yes, I will say they are intended to be, but you need to be intentional about that because it's if you're not intentional about it, sometimes they aren't as ethical as they are designed to be. So first, you know, things like de designing your work so, that's in, so that it is in the bent, best interest of those you're engaging and it's not exploitative, that's huge, okay? If needed, building in mechanisms for re-engaging stakeholders throughout your process so they feel that they're valued and actually part of the process and part of the work and part of the research from start to finish rather than engaging them once and never talking to them again, it's important. And seven, tailoring your process to the challenge. So human-centered design and design thinking are not intended to be one size fits all. And so in order to be true to the iterative and ethical and empathetic nature of design thinking, you want each of your processes to be specifically tailored to your challenge at hand, the context and the stakeholders that you're engaging. So all of these are really clear considerations to, to make as you're considering using a design thinking process. All right, any questions before we do some fun practice? It's like standing between you and a break, but not a break for practice. This is, yeah, Cecilia. Can you yes. give an example of tailoring the process to the challenge? Yeah. So when I showed you this, you know, the five-step process early, early on, um, and I'll go back to it now. So let's say we address a scope of work and we want to utilize this design thinking process. And we have previously done a workshop for maximizing engagement of, um, let's see, maximizing engagement of participants at X workshop. Okay. So that's been our design challenge that we are working on using this design thinking process to maximize that engagement of participants. For that, we used the five steps. We did a three, three day design thinking workshop and we used XYZ activities. Okay. Now let's say I'm given a whole different scope of work. And my scope of work now is to, let's see, let's use maximize again, to maximize adherence to calcium supplements for pregnant women in Ethiopia. Okay. And I decide to use the exact same process. I decide, all right, we're gonna do a three day workshop. We're gonna do all five steps, same activities. I'm gonna use my same slide deck, ready, go. Is Could that work? Maybe, but are you tailoring the process to your audience and to the people who are you're, you're engaging in the work? No. So I think what, what I'll say is what separates someone who does design thinking and someone who does design thinking well is that tailoring. Making sure you're being really critical about who's at your table, the problem, the who's at your table, and when I say that, I mean, the end users, key stakeholders related to the design challenge, the challenge at hand, your setting, all the different constraints at play, et cetera, and tailoring accordingly. So this five-step process in a three-day workshop is not going to work for everyone um, and, and being really okay with that and open to the tailoring. Thank you. I'm just thinking oh, that's a lot of work. It's a ton of work. And in one of my classes I was teaching today, I'm, I'm in a class teaching folks who want to be design thinking facilitators. And, you know, it's kind of sobering when I say to them or when I said to them today, yeah, you can't just do the same thing over and over again. You can't just master one agenda and rinse and repeat. Like it doesn't work that way. Um, and the different ways that I've utilized design thinking in my career has been so diverse. Of course, I've done, you know, the three-step or the three-day 
comprehensive workshop where we've gone through the five steps. But I've also more recently done work for um, a water and sanitation project in South Sudan where it didn't make sense to bring those end users to a co-creation workshop in the capital. So what did I need to do? I needed to do many community workshops with those end users, take the information from those end users, and then filter that in to a larger co-creation workshop at the capital with different types of stakeholders. So there's so many different ways to tailor this process and to maintain the integrity of the process um, and to be human-centered in, in the way you use it. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I, I don't... I'm trying to form like a clear question around access to end users. And like, I, I could imagine there might be situations where you aren't even sure at the outset, like who the exact end user is. And so like, how do you, how do you actually involve them early on? And then how do you sort of motivate end users? I, I can imagine sometimes like getting to beta test a new product would be exciting for people, but sometimes it's like engaging them around like health behaviors that like maybe they're not interested in. So like how to sort of like bring them in and motivate them to participate as well. Yeah, it's a good question. And you're right. Sometimes you don't know who the end user is going to be when you start a process. And oftentimes you'll start a process and you think you know who the end user is going to be but it actually doesn't turn out to be that person, or you might know who the target audience is for the desired outcome, but the solution that you're pitching isn't directly towards the target audience, right? It might be a few levels above. Um, like, you know, for example, you want to improve a health outcome. Well, the patient itself might not be the target of your intervention. Um, so, you know, these are all things that are possible in a design thinking process. Um, so I would say that that's why doing that initial stakeholder mapping, looking at any potential stakeholder related to that challenge is critical because then you're bringing them all in. Um, and then even if they don't end up being your end user or your target, their perspective is still important and is going to help you to get to that end goal. And then, you know, as, as we talked about before, if you're going through your process and you realize that those people that you need are not in the room, yeah, yeah. taking I'm a step well, back to then, to then engage those folks um, is really important. The other thing, your other question about how do you get people to do this? Uh, yeah, incentives, I feel like are critical. And in the work that I've done, incentives can take many different forms. Um, it can take the form of food. It can take the form of per diem. It can take the form of guaranteed authorship on a manuscript. Really, it, it really depends. And you'd want to tailor the incentive for the specific stakeholder that you're engaging. Because you're right. Sometimes, you know, the excitement of being part of developing a product or an intervention might not be as exciting to the people that you're engaging as it is to you. <laughs> so, but, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you need to do those classic incentives to keep them engaged. Great questions. Anyone else? Please also feel free to use the chat if you're more comfortable. All right, so now we're gonna move into the fun part. Let's do some practice. So now that you all have this comprehensive understanding of design thinking, it's as if you took a multi-term class with me, you are ready to do some practice. And I would like to welcome you all to your very own rapid design sprint. And our challenge of focus for your rapid design sprint is, drum roll please, Reimagining mentor mentee meetings to maximize value. Dun, 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 dun. Don't all of your mentor mentee meetings look like this? So happy, high fives. That is the goal. So, we are going to come up with some awesome solutions for reimagining the mentor mentee meetings to maximize value. And yes, I know many of you are already thinking about solutions, but I'm asking you not to. So, don't think about solutions yet. Here is our friend, the five-step design thinking process, and we're going to use this for our sprint today. Of course, we do not have time to do every step of the process, but we're going to start with the empathy phase. 
So during the empathy phase is where you determine all of the relevant stakeholders related to the challenge and you learn about them. Lucky for us, all of you are stakeholders in this challenge. So we're gonna learn from each other for our empathy practice. So we're gonna do that in the form of rapid stakeholder interviews. So in pairs, in just a few minutes, we're gonna put you into breakout rooms and I'm going to ask you to interview each other. So spend five minutes interviewing each other about experiences with mentor-mentee meetings at USC and then experiences with other mentor-mentee meetings outside of USC. Talk about things you loved, things you hated, your dreams, your feelings, et cetera. All the things, all the feelings, all the experiences, we wanna know about them. Take notes, so you're gonna spend five minutes with one of you being the interviewer, and then you're gonna switch and have the other person be the interviewer. Please take a screenshot of this so you have this for your breakout rooms. And I will ask, please, 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 refrain from discussing solutions. Do not use your interview time to talk about solutions. Use your interview time to learn about each other's experiences, all right? We're practicing empathy. Any questions before we go into our breakout rooms? I'll go back to the slide in case you still need a moment to take a screenshot. All right. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to ask Karen to please create the breakout rooms of pairs. We will have about 10 minutes for these stakeholder interviews. Make sure to take notes and then we'll come back together and move into the next step. All right. Thank you. I would love to hear about your experience, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next step. And I promise this was the exciting part. So now with that information in mind and you're feeling super empathetic, we are going to move into the ideation phase. So we're going to jump to the ideation phase today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some time to brainstorm creative solutions for the design challenge using an ideation activity called the bad idea brainstorm. You heard me right. We're going to brainstorm bad ideas, horrible solutions, terrible ones for the design challenge. The worst ones you can possibly think of. So why in the world would I ask you to do such a thing? And the reason is, is because oftentimes coming up with that perfect solution to a challenge from the very beginning seems almost paralyzing, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I have to come up with something perfect. It's so challenging. I can't even do it. So instead of asking you to come up with the perfect solution, I'm going to ask you to come up with the worst ones first. So for this activity, what you're going to do, I'm going to ask you to please take a piece of paper, fold it into four sections, or use a Word document, divide it into four sections, whatever is easiest for you. So I'll just pause for a second while you grab your piece of paper, or open a Word document. Make sure you have four distinct sections. All right. And when I say go, you are going to have four minutes to write out or sketch, if you're an artist, one horrible, terrible solution to the design challenge in each of your four sections. So four minutes for horrible solutions to the design challenge. And then when I say go, you're gonna put your pens down or take your fingers off the keyboard. As a reminder, you're coming up with terrible ideas for reimagining the mentor-mentee meetings to maximize value. So horrible ideas for this challenge. Keeping in mind everything you learned from your empathy phase work, those interviews that you just conducted with your colleagues. Okay, so four minutes on the clock, four solutions, one for each box, horrible, terrible solutions. All right, I'm going to keep this up so you can remember the challenge. I will take time and I'll let you know when the four minutes are up. All right, let's see those horrible solutions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, great. Good job. I love it. Love, I could feel that negative energy. Big fan. So thank you for the brainstorming those terrible ideas. Now what I'm going to ask you to do, we're going to go back into breakout rooms. And with your four terrible ideas in hand, 
in your breakout rooms, I'm going to ask you, of course, say a quick hello to each other. And then I want you to share your top two bad ideas of the four to the other people in your group. So what are your two worst ideas or your two favorite terrible ideas? Take those and share them with each other. Then as a team, I'm going to challenge you to select one idea or a combination of ideas and turn it into a great solution. Okay, so you're going to take your terrible ideas, take one or multiple and turn it into something fantastic, the best solution possible for solving your really important mentor mentee challenge. Then we're going to come back together in plenary and share those solutions with each other. It's a really great opportunity to solve a really important challenge today. So again, we'll go into breakout rooms, share your favorite one or two ideas that you brainstormed. Then as a team, turn those horrible ideas into something wonderful and then come back and be ready to do a quick round of sharing. Are there any questions before we open up those breakout rooms? All right, welcome back everyone. I'm so excited to hear about the amazing solutions that you came up with for our really important mentor mentee challenge. So I'm gonna ask each of the groups to share. I will stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other. And what I'll ask is that each of the groups, there were four of you, that each of the groups share the horrible idea that you had or horrible ideas you had, and then the good idea that you turned it into. All right. Is there a team that would like to kick us off? I don't know what team number we were, but I'm, I'm happy to sort of start us off. Great. You were uh, team two. Or room team two. two. All right. Um, so two of the sort of bad ideas that came up were overly frequent meetings that like aren't substantial and are short and you end up talking about like the weather instead of doing anything useful. Um, and overly rigid agendas that might be enforced through like fillable red cap surveys that have to be completed to get through the meeting or meetings that are, are just like completely unstructured and nothing gets discussed. Um, so our, our solution, we haven't come up with a name. Um, we have a few options, um, would be a new AI powered app to auto schedule meetings, come up with the agendas, keep notes during the meeting, and then generate highlights for, for mentor and mentee to review. A few potential names are chat GP mentee, Mentor Sync, Guidance Hub, or Mentor Matchup? That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or feedback for this team? Our group wants to know if you were cheating and listening in on our group. <laughs> we got ChatGPT to do that for us. <laughs> Elizabeth, would your team like to go? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Francis or Gal, do you want to present our our thing or? You can go ahead. All right. Um, oh, it should be one of the scholars. Do it. No, no, no. Francis, you go. Um, Liz, do you still have it pulled up on your screen, though? Yeah, yeah I'll put it up on the. Uh, OK, thank you. So I have, like, a weird thing on the site. There we go. OK, thanks. Um, some of the bad idea or so our, our idea is quite similar to the one that was just presented and it arose out of the bad concepts of like meetings that were either unstructured or where people were unavailable or not really discussing things openly or um, very like set in their ways and, and not really like listening to one another. So we also had this concept of creating um, like a meeting on the go phone app. And so these are meant for um, kind of short meetings that you can do while walking or, or in your car, um, CarPlay enabled. Um, and they would have clear topics planned ahead of time and entered into the app um, by the mentee. And then kind of as you're using the app, there would be a limited time per topic. So it's really like focusing small bites of um information and small conversations that are like five minutes long, maybe with like a one minute warning. And then we also were hoping to do some kind of AI generated um, notes or action items for the mentee to review afterward. And those would be based off of like these audio recordings. 
Um, and overall, the goal would be to help better visualize action items like deadlines, tasks, responsibilities. Um, we thought this would be a great like on the go kind of a thing, but at the same time, we would want to intersperse this program with formal sit down meetings. Um, but uh, I think maybe our group and Adam's group could, or, or team two could kind of meld ideas and, and make one great iOS and Android compatible app. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And I love that these are similar ideas, but there's they're slightly nuanced. So I think you're right. Working together would be a nice next step to figure out which direction you would take your prototype in. So I love it. Thank you so much. Can All we right. Join so my we, group too. <laughs> you want to join too? You have another solution similar? Oh gosh, yeah. Um I think I think I we're think... speaking to a need, folks. We're speaking to a need. <laughs> I think we do, judging based on our bad idea, also related around some of the overly structured um, and sometimes deliverable oriented meetings that may inhi inhibit some of the idea generation we talked about. Actionable steps, mentoring on the move, uh, specifically, this is uh, Isaac's uh, idea to give credit. Um, with the idea of doing more scheduling walking meetings between mentor and mentee and having a more casual approach um, and a great environment for the idea generation um, and some of the more personalized uh, feedback on our career development. And we said, yeah, not able to take notes on the go, record the conversation on your phone or use an AI assistant. So we would love to use your AI device uh, when that is available. I love that. I love this idea of being on the go when you're doing this meeting, get away from Zoom. Let's just do these things while we're moving and let's utilize AI for good, for taking some notes. Why not? I love that. All right. Thank you so much. So I we have one team left. I think it's team one. Team yep, one, that's that. to go. Awesome. Yeah, I can share our um, agenda or not agenda. I guess that's what we're talking about. Um, so we came up, we talked about like the problem being um, just uh, unproductive meetings and meetings with low engagement um, and lack of structure. And so we decided to just go old school and say that um, recommend like an agenda that you uh, send to your mentor before every meeting and you prioritize, like you make a list of priorities um, and you start with the things that are most pressing and then obviously decrease priority as you go down. Um, and that will uh, make it so that you are able to address the things that you care about the most in that meeting. Um, something we talked about towards the end of our discussion was, you know, there is a potential for it to be very mentee focused and maybe we want to make time for both mentor and mentee priorities, Priorities, but hopefully they, if it's a good match, they should be pretty aligned in that. Um, so that shouldn't be a huge problem, but yeah. So we just very old school, <laughs> nothing, nothing new and in innovative, but important. But innovative that you're bringing it back to basics. I think that's huge and a really, really important thing to consider. So thank you for sharing that. I'm really impressed by the solutions you all came up with in a really short period of time. And if we had more time together, what we would do is we would take those solution nuggets. We would test them with a target audience get some quick feedback, and then determine where in the process do we need to loop back to in order to gain more information to then refine our solution and then test it again until we've come up with something final. So I think we are on a wonderful path to take some of these ideas moving forward. If anyone is interested here to do so outside of our session today, I think you have some great ideas to start with. Any questions or reactions um, regarding the activities that we just practiced? I know and I recognize that we didn't do a full design thinking process. Of course, we didn't have time for that today. But any initial thoughts or reactions on the activities that you did do in Teams? While you're thinking, I'm going to reshare my screen. All right, so I'll let it all marinate a little bit. I know it's been quick. It's been a very, very fast, high level overview of design thinking and then a very rapid design sprint that I engaged you all in. So 
a lot of information, a lot of high level information. I'm sure I left you with a lot of questions. You're like, okay, I want to know. I want to know more. Tell me more about design thinking. Um, so before we move on, I do want to close with a bit of a discussion. I have a few prompts that I want you to think about and I will open it up for, for thoughts and reactions. Feel free to unmute and give me your thoughts or provide them in the chat. But if for the first question I want you to think about is really what are some opportunities that you see to apply design thinking in your work and in your research? Is there anything that jumps out at you now that you have a sense of what design thinking is? Any opportunities for application in the, in the things that you're doing? One jumps at me. <laughs> Please. Uh, thinking about, especially research labs, how we can design the place to make people, stimulate people to bring in innovative ideas. I know when we get to research lab, it's all about these test tubes and stuff. Yeah, Maybe there's a way that we can um, find um, at a, uh, some some paintings or some, some things to put there that when people enter the place, it just stimulates them to come out with. So nice ideas and ways to stimulate them to do more research. Okay, so reimagining the space so that people feel more inclined to do more research there. Is that yeah. what, you're, what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you for sharing that idea. Any other thoughts? I have a thought about... Um clinical trials. So um, in clinical trials, at least now we're more aware of um, how important it is to engage um, all populations in clinical trials, especially like in Los Angeles, the populations that historically have not been so involved in trials in the past. Um, so there might be a way to include or to apply design thinking in reaching out to those patient populations um, like the idea of the rapid stakeholder interviews really reminded me of like, um, what do we call them? Patient, like uh, patient advisory boards kind of asking what mm -hmm. do they value so that we can make sure we meet them halfway or, or address their needs and then um, kind of develop um, develop new ways to reach out to them and to to connect with patients for clinical trials. I love that. I think that's such a wonderful application and a really good opportunity. And it reminds me of um, um, a project that I'm working on right now that has to do with maternal supplements. And it's a randomized control trial to figure out kind of the efficacy of this supplement. And there we are using design thinking to come up with um, adherence approaches to make sure that we have greater adherence to both arms of the study to help us figure out, you know, is this actually working better or not? Um, and I think that application is very similar to what you're talking about, just making sure that we're meeting these folks who are there, we're designing our research studies to meet the needs of the people that we're engaging, meet their expectations, meet their desires. And that not only is gonna make them more likely to engage, but it's gonna make our research better too. So really, really wonderful opportunity. Thank you for sharing. As you're thinking about that, I'm gonna throw out another question. Related, but based off your experiences, what are some similarities and differences between design thinking and other problem solving processes or research methods that you've used? What do you think? What are some of those differences? What are those similarities that are really sticking out to you? I can share, this is Yao speaking. Um, we do research um, with a lot of users with disabilities. Um, there is a similar concept called, uh, called participatory design. Um, basically, it's not very medical model based. It's that's like top down. The researchers is um, deemed as the power of actually designing like how things should be facil facilitated 
but rather the participants of our research have the equal um, agency or decision-making power to share their needs. Um, this is very common in human uh, computer interaction research, but um, I, I think they're in the similar lines with like design thinking. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of the people are working in the similar industry roles. Um, it's been a very effective model for us, um, at least working in accessibility. We deal with individuals with disability, but they're not just patients. They could be like users of technology who also um, experiencing similar things like our clinicians are experiencing like challenges with EMR. I think the best example we can relate to is when we think about how tricky the EMRs are with physicians and therapists, we relate to that um, experience of being challenged by the technology. So mm -hmm. I, I really like the exercise today about mentor-mentee. I definitely plan to think about uh, implementing some of the tips in my advising meetings. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And I encourage you to look at a research from Microsoft called Inclusive Design. So it really looks at what you're talking about um, with regard to disabilities and different types of disabilities and how that impacts a wide variety of things and how to keep that at the forefront of your design. So definitely check that out if you haven't already done so. Thank you for sharing. All right, I'm going to put one more question out there. And feel free to answer any of them, any of these questions or none of the questions. And if you want to ask something totally different, please feel free. So the last question is, what opportunities do you see for leveraging design thinking approaches alongside traditional quantitative and qualitative research methods and vice versa? I mean, I, I think about qualitative work a lot as formative to intervention design or as um, sequential, like after you're done, like, okay, what worked and what didn't that I'm not capturing in a survey? Um, and I think thinking about this as like more directed and integrated is probably different than how I've been approaching qualitative work, which is a little more open, like, let's see what happens. And, and you know, sometimes that's not what you need at that stage is yeah. that big, long six month process. Like you were like, I need to do five quick interviews and like get to an answer quickly. And, and I see this as being potentially more useful in some of those formative stages. Awesome. I, that makes complete sense. I think that's a really good way to look at it in a really wonderful application of design thinking within that formative research space. So thank you for sharing. All right, folks, I recognize it's the end of the day. So I will open it up at this point. If anyone has any lingering questions for me or any insights you want to share, please feel free at this time. Ask away comment away, anything you want to share that the space is yours. I'm just wondering if, you know, afterwards you can send us two or three resources that you think would be, would be nice for, for everyone who came to engage a little bit more with this topic or, you know, even master it in the future. Uh, 100%. I would def I'll definitely do that. I'll share some of my favorite resources that I use. Um, and then hopefully you can take the time to, to check those out and learn more about design thinking. And as always, I'm here. So if you have any questions for me, and you know, maybe you, it didn't hit you today, but tomorrow when you're thinking about this, or when you're possibly thinking about this in a month, or you're working on a new research study, and you're like, maybe I can apply design thinking here, feel free to reach out. My email address is on the screen. I'm available to answer any questions that you have about design thinking. So never hesitate to send me an email. Also feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, whatever form you are most comfortable with communicating, I am here for you. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And hopefully I will cross paths with you all again in the future. So thank you so much. I'm gonna clap, uh, clap and I want to thank you so much, first of all, for meeting with, with us before to kind of understand who our audience was and then kind of thinking about what the challenge was going to be, and really uh, putting yourself at our, our disposition to make sure that this this um, session was successful. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you.